We looked in our electron theory notes in the classroom that a copper atom has a loosely held electron in the outer shell. This loosely held electron is negatively charged and is free to flow amongst the copper atoms. If we can cause this loosely bound negatively charged electron to move in one direction through the material, in this case copper, we have the basic principles of current flow. In order for current to flow, we need to apply an EMF, an electromotive force, to the conductive material. And we saw in my previous presentation, that's caused in three ways, chemically, magnetically, or thermal. These electrons themselves are too small to quantify as individual electrons. We quantify them as a coulomb. When working out mathematical questions that requires us to find the coulomb, in other words, the transfer of electrons through a conductor, we need to use the formula Q for coulombs equals I for current times time in seconds. So to find coulombs in an exam question, we would use Q equals I times T, which we said also could be quit, quit. Q equals I times T. We can use a triangle in order to work out the other two missing elements of Q equals I times T. We said that if we covered over the one we were looking for, mathematically we could work out the other one, whether it would be Q over T to find current, or Q over I in order to find time and time being in seconds. After doing questions based on coulombs, Q equals I times T and the formula to find current and time in seconds, we went on to look at the underpinning knowledge for Ohm's law. First of all, we looked at a basic circuit, basic circuit comprising of an EMF, conductive materials throughout the circuit, a fuse, a switch for control, and a load. In one of my other presentations, we looked at basic Ohm's law and basic simple circuits in order to find voltage, current, and resistance. The formula being V equals I times R. Sometimes people like to say Ohm's law is very interesting reading. V equals I times R. After we looked at those basic circuits comprising of a load, applied voltage and a current in order to work out resistance, current and voltage. We developed that on to look at series circuits with more than one resistive load. Our default position for the exam is to remember everything that I say, nice position to be in. However, if we were only going to remember some elements of the underpinning knowledge for principles, this video presentation is trying to default us to that position. One where maybe a calculator isn't used, but knowledge can be answered within this section of the principles exam. So we said in a series circuit, the common element is current. So the current flows through the whole circuit and is common throughout. We said an ammeter is connected in series and is of very low resistance. Again, this question comes up in the section under Ohm's law. The total resistance in a series circuit is the sum of the individual resistors. If you had a resistance of two ohms, five ohms and 10 ohms, the simple addition of two plus five plus 10 giving you 17 ohms for total resistance in a series circuit. Total voltage in a series circuit is your voltage that pairs across each individual resistor added together. We then moved on to look at parallel circuits. Parallel circuits are slightly more involved, but again, we're looking for a default position in order to answer some of those multi-choice questions. The common element in a parallel circuit is voltage. Voltage will appear across each of the loads exactly the same as the supply voltage. The total resistance in a parallel circuit is not as straightforward as simply adding them together. We looked at the formulas in the classroom, and again, I would expect you to try and remember those to get the higher level of pass, the distinction level of pass, okay? However, this video presentation is to put us in a position where we get the required surface-based knowledge in order to pass the exam. So we need a default position. If we've got two resistors in parallel of the same value, say they're both four ohms, the total resistance in circuit is half of one of those resistors. In other words, two ohms. Two 10 ohm resistors connected in parallel, the total resistance will be five ohms. If we have three resistors connected in parallel, they're all of say nine ohms each, the total resistance in that circuit would be three ohms. In other words, a third of one of the resistors. And we can see how this pattern moves on as we go to four, etc. Another one worth remembering on parallel resistors is, we have a 200 ohm resistor, a 200 ohm resistor, and a one ohm resistor connected in parallel. 
the total resistance in circuit is less than one ohm. We are heading towards a multi-choice exam that may give you answers with only one resistor value less than the smallest one of those connected in parallel. No need to work it out, no need to get a calculator out and start working ourselves through more complicated sums. The answer will be less than the smallest resistor in circuit. Great position to be in. Another formula that makes the total resistance of two resistors connected in parallel more simple is the one where it's product over sum. In other words, we take the two resistor values and multiply them together and we put it over the two resistors added together and therefore work the calculation out for the total resistance in that circuit. We also looked at connecting a voltmeter in a circuit. A voltmeter in a circuit is connected in parallel and is a very high resistance. This is a whistle stop tour of Ohm's law and is the minimum requirement of knowledge heading into our Christmas exams. However, we'd expect to have a deeper, more understanding knowledge um, of the section that we're in on Ohm's law. However, this is what we need to fall back onto. Fault position is to remember those key elements that I've just mentioned in this